Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the, the introduction. I'm really delighted to be participating in this series and to be bringing my research, which deals with the history of life sciences and technologies into conversation with present day research. Um, and I'm assuming that a lot of you zooming in are, are, are researchers uh, at present. So I want to start the session today by just explaining a bit about who I am, about the way in which my knowledge of plant sciences databases has developed, because it's uh, undoubtedly a little bit idiosyncratic. So I'm a historian of science and technology, and my particular expertise within that lies in the history of plant science and, and biotechnologies. For the past several years, I've been writing and researching about the history of efforts to conserve genetic diversity in crops. And that's the subject of my latest book, which was published last year, Endangered Maize. As part of that research, I've spent some time considering the history of seed or gene banking. And these are terms that I'll kind of use interchangeably in my talk today, in part reflecting the ways in which different actors have um, categorized the work that they do. So I'm sure everybody tuning in knows that seed banking today predominates as a strategy for conserving crop diversity, at least within the vast majority of state and scientist led programs. It's by no means the whole story in terms of the conservation of crop genetic diversity, but it is a really, really important part. So writing about the history of seed collections, of gene banking from the early 20th century up to the present day has really led me, among other things, to a greater appreciation of this very complex project of keeping track of samples accessioned in these collections, right? The problem of how best to maintain and share knowledge about plant genetic materials through time and across distances. And this in turn has led me unexpectedly in many ways to research the history of database development, which is foundational to effective seed banking, as much as seed banking is thought to be foundational to the long-term conservation of genetic diversity. So what I'm gonna do in my talk today is just share a few episodes, a few key episodes from that research that I've done with you. My aim is not to offer a comprehensive history of plant science databases. I definitely don't have that kind of expertise. There's obviously a wide range of activities that that encompasses, different domains of plant sciences. Uh, instead, what I'd like to do is share these very select aspects of the history of database development, specifically database development to support plant germplasm conservation and utilization. And then in the process to kind of use that uh, that history to think about the ways in which databases were and are also imagined as political instruments as well as research tools. So a central focus of my talk as advertised in the, the summary that was sent out will be the attempt to establish cross-institution European gene bank databases using the specific example of a barley database uh, that was first developed um, starting in the, in the 1980s and 90s. But I'm going to set up this central case via a brief illustration of what it took both technically and politically to motivate the first computerized records of the world's major collection of Latin American maize diversity, uh, and, and that database was set up in Mexico. And then I'm going to conclude with an example of database development in relation to sweet potato germplasm in the Pacific that I think highlights some of the profound challenges that researchers faced and still face in addressing equity and inclusion in database practices. So just a little bit of a roadmap of the talk, I'm gonna talk about computerizing catalogs through the example of maize at the International Center for the Improvement of Maize and Wheat or CIMIT. I'm gonna talk about collectivizing catalogs through the example which I mentioned, barley germplasm across European collections. And then think about this problem or project of diversifying description through the example of sweet potato in the Philippines and the greater Pacific region. And I'm going to be really eager to hear questions and reflections and thoughts and experiences from participants at the conclusion of the talk today. So much of today's international infrastructure for the conservation of crop diversity was forged in the 1970s and 80s. 
the real and perceived effects of international agricultural aid programs of the late 1950s and 60s. Uh, uh, effects which are often labeled the Green Revolution in agricultural production, uh, which saw seeds of improved varieties sent around the world, galvanized new initiatives for collecting and conserving crop diversity. From 1974, an international board of plant genetic resources, the IBPGR, uh, which many of you will know today as Bioversity, um, which operates in, in, uh, in concert with SIAT in Colombia, uh, organized under the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research, CGIAR, recently reorganized as 1CG, uh, attempted to coordinate the conservation efforts of national institutions and international agricultural research centers, and to really encourage further programs through the strategic sponsoring of collection missions and conservation facilities. One result of this work was a boom in conservation at national and international levels. The size of collections and the number of seed banks both rose significantly in the 1970s. And the International Board for Plant Genetic Resources, the IBPGR, worked to coordinate these activities into an international system with moderate success. By the mid-1980s, however, these international coordinating efforts and the IBPGR organized network of seed banks were under intense external scrutiny. Thanks in part to a very vocal and impressively mobilized international group of seed activists who were working in alliance with multiple institutions and, and individuals in the global south. Um, uh, as, as a result of that mobilization, the 1980s really saw a powerful surge in critiques of and resistance to the World Conservation Network, the, the World Network of Seed Banks and Gene Banks that had only really recently coalesced. And you see a really famous example of contributions uh, on the part of activists to, to those debates, um, this book Seeds of the Earth by um, Pat Mooney, which, which perhaps some of you are familiar with. So a fight over the control of seed and germplasm banks and indeed the stewardship of um, uh, plant genetic resources more broadly which was fostered by activists, pursued by the non-aligned states at the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO or FAO from the 1980s onwards, brought this new scrutiny to seed banks and their collections. And studies soon compiled many shortcomings of national and international conservation efforts. These included everything from broken refrigeration systems to lost samples to restrictions on access within collections. Uh, these, of course, came in part from critics of the international um, uh, seed banking system and the ways it had been set up, but it also came from, uh, in part, champions of existing structures uh, who had to acknowledge that the successes of gathering seed samples since the early 1970s had, in fact, created a significant influx of materials uh, for the purposes of conservation, and that this influx of conservation collections, in turn, multiplied the labor that was needed in processing and monitoring and evaluating samples. And these were demands that were not by and large matched by the kind of consistent increases in funding to institutions with seed collections that were needed. Even more problematically at this, at this moment, the burgeoning size of collections had not been accompanied by increasing demand. A 1984 study of seed and gene bank use, which was conducted by the International Board for Plant Genetic Resources, in fact, co-authored by its executive secretary, described a, quote, consensus of opinion that breeders were mostly ignoring these new collections. So this acknowledgement that, that seed banks often struggled to stay abreast of uh, critical maintenance activities and that they often failed to provide meaningful services to breeders in terms of getting those collections uh, into circulation and use, prompted calls for new developments for strategies and conservation activity. A demand for more and better information about gene bank accessions, that is a call for, for good data, was central to many um, of, these, of these demands or these um, attempts to reimagine how conservation should work. And that's really where I get uh, to the history of databases. So one priority area that emerged at this moment of crisis in the 1980s was the development or indeed the acceleration of computerized and networked record keeping. 
which most researchers and curators thought would improve the quality of data about accessions and collections, which would then in turn facilitate improved care, while also addressing this issue of use, right? It would encourage greater use through greater accessibility uh, to data. At the same time, uh, or sorry, at this time, many uh, seed and gene banks still operated with heterogeneous paper records. Uh, and whether they were maintained on paper or had been preliminarily computerized, these records were likely only to be accessible on site uh, and to have, uh, as a matter of fact, also very incomplete information. So even the most committed researcher did have a hard time knowing from a remote location about materials held in different collections, let alone then getting access to those materials. So we can just uh, consider the maize gene bank at the Mexico-based International Center for the Improvement of Maize and Wheat, or CIMIT, uh, which was home to one of the largest collections of maize germplasm in the world, uh, and really imagined to be one of the institutions holding germplasm for international access in the interest of international agricultural development. The CIMIT maize gene bank had been neglected for the better part of the 1970s. It was devalued by program directors who saw little reward in the never-ending task of regenerating seeds of thousands of land races of maize that scientists had collected and stored, uh, in some cases in samples that dated back to the early 1940s. As with other maize gene banks across Latin America, many samples remained minimally documented, uh, even at the level of passport information, so the very basic level of documentary uh, kind of identification record, and few, if any, of them had uh, significant evaluation data appended to them. And therefore, as a consequence of these features, those uh, accessions rarely made it into breeding programs, circumstances which in turn further compounded questions about their value and made their survival at all something that was seen to be increasingly perilous. Uh, and this, I should note, was something that left CIMIT. It also left the, the CGIAR and, and IVPGR um, as kind of overarching governing institutions open to these criticisms that I mentioned earlier about the, the quality of care and stewardship of accessions that were meant to be uh, held for users around the world. So if by the 1970s it seemed likely that many of the CIMIT collections would simply die in storage, circumstances had in fact reversed by the mid-1980s, so within just a few years. As the battles over the stewardship of seeds, which I've just described, raged at FAO from the early 1980s, these are debates that eventually precipitated the International Seed Treaty um, a couple decades later. Um, but as those debates uh, continued, CIMIT explicitly repositioned itself as the logical central node from World Maze Network, which would be dedicated to the conservation and free exchange of the world's extant corn diversity. The physical infrastructure of the bank was upgraded at that time to create new long-term storage capacity. Uh, this was in 1984. And CGIAR delivered further funding that would allow for dedicated seed bank staff and important to us here, much needed computer capacity. So in short, after a period of significant neglect, the Institute wanted to reassert CIMIT's central coordinating role in conservation and distribution of maize germplasm globally. And it put data management, data generation actually, and data management at the center of this conservation effort. And all of this was really a direct response to political agitation around the safety and availability of seeds which were said to be conserved as a global patrimony by CGIAR institutions. So in 1985, the breeder Sukitoshi Taba took over the curation of the CIMIT maize gene bank with this agenda of developing better data for curation and improved access in mind. And truly Taba's first priority towards improving conservation and circulation of seed uh, was one of record keeping. The bank, when he took it over, desperately needed a single exhaustive catalog, which necessitated his gathering information, much of it incomplete from scattered records and logs, to compile the first full list of the bank's contents. Only then could this list be populated with passport data, perhaps further documentation where it existed, such as evaluation information. And then this in turn could, in theory, be sent to any user who would request seeds, someone who would now not only be more likely to receive the co correct seed, something that had been a problem in the past, but also all of the uh, additional information that was appended to it. Preparing this catalog required more secretarial assistance, a computer programmer, software development, 
updated practices of data gathering in the field, uh, and even a reconnaissance mission on the part of Taba to the Mexican National Maze Collection, which was just down the road from Simit, to reacquire collection uh, information about samples that were in its possession. So all of this was a laborious task. Uh, it was, of course, or set of tasks, I should say, but it, but it wasn't the end of the road. Uh, because CIMIT was imagining itself as becoming the center of a world maze network of researchers, it also needed to know what was in other collections. Uh, and that too proved something uh, to be something that was hard to discover. As Taba insisted, a fundamental precondition for an effective maze germplasm networks was that all participants quote, possess a complete electronic database on the materials that they hold. In other words, in order to undertake the, the kind of, in other words, those institutions had to undertake the collation efforts that Taba himself was undertaking and would need the kind of resources that he had been provided in order to carry this out uh, on their end as well. Other institutions would in theory have help, uh, and that's because CIMIT proposed to take the lead in aggregating and standardizing and re-disseminating the accession data for these Latin American maize gene banks. So I think as, as many of you will know today, most organism-centered research communities, such as geneticists who study fruit flies, plant scientists working with Arabidopsis, uh, folks working on uh, different uh, genomic platforms, depend on community-wide electronic databases. Uh, in many ways, like the, the printed communications that preceded those databases, right, the, the maize genetics newsletter or the, the, the um, uh, Drosophila fly newsletter, uh, these databases simultaneously draw information from, but also discipline users into different practices, right? They shape the language and the standards of practice of geographically dispersed scientists, and in the process, create the very communities that they are um, purported to serve. So I would suggest that in proposing to centralize data on maize land races at CIMIT, Taba and his colleagues sought similar transformations. Uh, and like many colleagues, he considered this reorganization to be truly essential to the, 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 um, the movement, meaning like the movement between research institutions, uh, as well as the long-term conservation of seed. And I would be remiss uh, if I were to point out that it was also something that was seen to be essential to institutional survival, to the survival of Latin American gene banks, to the survival of CIMIT as a world-leading maize research center, and to, to CGIAR and IBPGR in relation to their claims to and defense of global stewardship of seeds at this moment in time. In the days before network databases, the best way for Taba to actualize a network of maize collections was to create a master database of all the local databases, once these were created, of course. And then in an idealized vision, the hub would receive updates from the nodes and anyone wanting maize germplasm, in this case, germplasm chiefly for Latin America, could apply to the hub, in this case, CIMIT, and learn about the options that existed across the system. And that leads me to the next step in my history, which is the, the history of collectivizing catalogs. And rather than continue with the story of maize seed in Latin America, I'm gonna shift our attention to barley seeds in Europe. So for many, if not most gene bank curators and research administrators, database development was seen as a way to improve tracking of and access to, oops, sorry about that, tracking of and access to collections. However, there were some who wanted to see them used even more strategically. So in 1984, the IBPGR estimated that 95% of samples in gene banks had no agronomic data, uh, evaluation data attached to them. And this, as I've already suggested, meant that they weren't terribly inviting for breeders to use uh, to be incorporated into crop development programs. And since these evaluation data were costly and time consuming to generate, it was likely that they would continue to be absent from the records for a long time to come. Observing this pattern in the early 1980s, IBPGR announced that it would shift its focus from collecting to producing these needed evaluation data on accessions. And in making that shift, it immediately faced another problem, and that was the problem of duplication. A 1984 study of seed and gene bank conservation based on a survey of some 760 scientists determined that 
at least 50% of the combined collections of most crop species are duplicate accession. And that's a, a quotation from the um, document that you see uh, uh, listed here. So also, although this seemed good from the perspective of having as much biodiversity extant as possible, it also presented a problem, particularly given the finite resources that existed uh, in this space as in, as in so many others. Uh, as this researcher noted, indiscriminate duplication of entire collections at numerous gene banks is costly and unnecessary. And then if one added to this the labor of evaluating accessions, right, to generate this data that was recognized as being necessary to the effective use of collections, uh, if you added that, that um, cost of the labor of evaluating accessions to that of maintaining them, then these unintended costs of accession duplication intensified even further. Now, this was not an easy concern to resolve. Uh, unnecessary duplication increased the cost of maintaining collections, including the cost of evaluating these. But evaluation was also needed to identify duplicates if collections were to be rationalized in the ways that multiple researchers were calling for. So on the one hand, this led some, led some experts, uh, experts to dismiss the idea of rationalization, which is to say eliminating redundancy across collections, as something that would be simply not cost effective, um, especially at a, at a time before rapid uh, genetic screening. A few seed bank curators were nonetheless interested in reducing duplication, both within their own collections and then also among gene banks with whom they had close ties. And to do this primarily as a cost-saving measure, uh, recognizing the limitations uh, on their abilities to, um, to carry out conservation in the ways that were imagined, and given the resources that were available. So in either within or across gene bank rationalization, eliminating duplicates meant first acquiring or producing better data about individual accessions, and then reducing duplication across gene banks would also demand coordination across these institutions, and especially the harmonization of data practices, such as documentation methods, coding systems, choices of hardware and software, uh, and more. So one group that made progress along these lines, uh, or I should say more progress along these lines than many other uh, institutions in the final decades of the 20th century, at least to, to my knowledge of this domain, um, and, and which therefore serves as, as one of my case studies was the Barley Working Group. Uh, and this was a group of researchers, a group of scientists who were responsible for European barley collections, who were brought together by the European Cooperative Program for Crop Genetic Resources. This European Cooperative Program was initially funded and organized by the United Nations Developments Program and the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO. But they were later folded into the International Board for Plant Genetic Resources, as you can see here. And it was tasked with coordinating crop conservation across Europe with the ultimate aim of, quote, permit, permitting direct access on the part of every breeder to the germplasm of the entire continent, thus making possible a previously unattainable level of plant breeding efficiency, uh, end quote. So that's the, the sort of ambition and goal uh, of this program. And within this program, with this goal in mind, crop databases were seen as the chief instruments for coordination. Although the or program's organizers had uh, initially and ideally wanted to establish one or a few centralized European gene banks, there were neither the resources nor the will for creating new transnational institutions of this kind. And the cooperative program, therefore, uh, early on imagined as an alternative that Existing institutions would become the lead centers for a certain crop or for several crops. Those centers would take on responsibility for maintaining and providing access to all of the accessions of that crop uh, on behalf of participating countries. But this scaled back or already scaled back ambition was eventually further transformed into the notion of a kind of collective decentralized gene bank, which would be achieved through a master database of all collections, which would be held at the lead center. So this was sort of like what I described CIMIT uh, attempting to do for all of Latin American maize, right? Which should be an indication that this was the, um, the best working solution for this kind of project. So databases in this case would not only be useful for uh, decentralizing and rationalizing collections, 
but also potentially, uh, as organizers hoped, identifying gaps in European holdings that could then be resolved through either further collecting missions um, or, or other kinds of exchange activities, uh, and also would enable strategic planning for evaluation so that this could be carried out with a minimum of duplication. And I just want to emphasize here before I kind of continue with the technical details, the overarching program here, this European uh, cooperative program, had explicit aims of creating international and interinstitutional connections and dependencies. Right? It was a project of a, of a unifying European community, uh, which was increasingly important in forging a broader Europe from the late 1980s, especially as the Cold War came to a conclusion. And so as I describe the, the details of how the, um, you know, this networking was to unfold, I think it's also important to realize that this took place within a particular political setting uh, and at a particular moment of um, political change within Europe. Uh, that 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 really informed how different uh, initiatives took shape. So the overarching cooperative program laid out an idealized workflow for crop germplasm communities that 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 they would follow. Uh, and the Barley Working Group adhered to this pretty closely in its first few years, from 1983 to 1987. Topping its list of action items was the complete documentation of European barley collections which would be carried out according to a standard list of descriptors. Um, this is to say a standard list of agreed traits or informational categories to track over time, and also the standard terms for recording these. This was then to be followed by the registration of the data in computer databases, the detection of replication in accessions, and then these steps would in turn make possible the rationalization of collections by agreement by, between participating gene banks, and consequently, the quote, elimination of potential waste of resources in the storage, multiplication, characterization, and evaluation of redundant accessions, end quote. So in other words, the immediate improvements that were hoped for in data creation and management and exchange would reduce the costs of collection management, including further costly data generation, which is to say the evaluation of duplicate accessions, and then documentation, database development, and deduplication would also result in a decentralized European barley gene bank, one that was managed not by uh, any one institution, but really collectively uh, by all. The first European or the first version of the European barley database, which was created in pursuit of these goals, uh, was assembled between 1984 and 1987 and brought together the passport data associated with about 60,000 barley accessions from more than 30 European collections in 26 countries. Although it had some immediate usefulness for breeders in seeking germplasm from collaborating institutions, it was not effective for the key purposes of deduplication or not as, yeah, sorry, it was not effective for the key purposes of, of deduplication and decentralization. As one of the researchers described, the identification of duplicates in the emerging database was itself a time-consuming procedure requiring much knowledge about the breeding and collecting history of a particular crop. And this was information that generally wasn't available and, and which would be costly to produce. A couple of researchers investigated multiple means of engineering around this problem of poor and incomplete data uh, that, um, uh, was the fundamental hindrance in many ways to authoritative identification of duplicates within the database. But for the Barley Working Group, the circumstances um, that, they, that they faced institutionally and with, re with respect to um, further financial support really actually meant scaling back on the ambitions of rationalization, at least for a time. After a 10-year hiatus due to lack of funding, the European Barley Database was renewed in the 1990s, uh, and by 2001, it had been linked with other international collections, bringing the total number of accessions within the database to uh, about 130,000. Although at this time in 2001, the identification of duplicates was again listed as a key outcome of further database development, the payoff of this identification had shifted. It was not in creating opportunities for uh, eliminating redundancy any longer, but simply allowing better data sharing allowing links, as the um, organizers of the debate database described, allowing links to be established between accessions and their evaluation data accessible in respective databases. 
So this vision, uh, as the, the, the researchers articulated in 2001, this vision of databases as tools for sharing information, for linking research communities, for pooling knowledge. I think this is the story that really predominates in both celebratory and critical accounts of Seed and Gene Bank's database development projects, such, that, such, such as a, a history exists. But I think looking at the history, especially through the European Cooperative Program and the Barley Database, it's important to also appreciate these have, of having, as having been driven by a desire for greater economy, in the expenditure of scarce resources, um, and in this case, ironically forestalled for the lack of funds. Uh, and also they're having been driven and um, fostered by larger political visions and ambitions. Uh, in this example, the forging of joint European enterprises and inter interdependencies. And these two are essential functions of and aspirations for databases. Now, I think I would be remiss to be um, to to kind of end this talk with a suggestion that it was limited time and financial resources alone that repeatedly frustrated network database development of the kind that was imagined at CIMIT and within the uh, European Cooperative Program in the late 20th century. There were, of course, technical challenges too. Uh, with one of the most significant, I think, being the standardization of data on crops, especially across languages disciplinary divides. So it should no, therefore be no surprise to learn that the standardization of crop descriptors for the purposes of systematic recording of data about gene bank accession and uh, uh, research and breeding materials more generally has in fact also uh, been a longstanding ambition of crop researchers and gene bank curators. So crop descriptor lists, which um, some of you might be familiar with, dictate the features of plants that, um, for example, collectors should note when collecting in the field, like um, some of the, the categories that you see listed here on this list, uh, but also uh, the categories that breeders or other researchers should attend to in characterizing or evaluating these samples, and also that curators of gene banks uh, could or should be tracking over time. And in addition to following those qualities, they also dictate a standard way of recording, which is uh, to say a descriptor state. Um, sorry about that. So lists of descriptors have, have been imagined since the late 1960s as means of facilitating exchange of information about and access to seed and gene banks by creating a single common language for researchers who work on a particular crop species um, to share. The production of descriptor lists accelerated with the establishment of the International Board for Plant Genetic Resources in 1974, and especially with the transfer of collection catalogs from paper to digital format, and this vision of efficient universal access, which I've already described a, a number of times uh, in the presentation. So producing crop descriptor lists for international use has been one of the International Board for Plant Genetic Resources and its successor institutions, uh, IPGRI uh, and, and Bioversity. It's been one of those institutions hallmark contributions to international agricultural research and development. And this powerful linguistic enterprise is very much overlooked, I think, in the celebration of computer infrastructure as having been um, the element to really significantly open horizons. So together with my collaborator, Sabina Leonelli of Exeter University, I've tracked the history of crop descriptors as a technical tool in uh, plant uh, sciences research. And one of the most interesting things to observe in that history is an oscillation between minimal lists of descriptors and maximal lists of descriptors. So just to explain this a bit further, the earliest efforts that were undertaken to assemble crop descriptors, uh, for example, in rice and wheat starting in the 1960s, accelerating in the 70s, uh, emphasized the need to create lists of the fewest possible traits for tracking, um, in particular, uh, in order to stay within the operating constraints of um, uh, what uh, computer resources were available at the time, as well as the time constraints and the resource constraints of curators and breeders. Big lists of passport data needed and essential traits to track would be so demanding that it would actually discourage the use of these lists. So that was the, 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 the understanding at the time. And this assumption really seems to have been well and good at first, especially in an early green revolution moment when the focus was on key commodity crops and irrigated commercial farming. But as international agricultural research efforts 
branched out to encompass more crops, more farmers, also more disciplines in the 1980s. This desire for minimal description gave way to an interest in more maximal uh, approaches. And I think it's telling that the first crop for which uh, what was then still uh, the IBPGR issued a maximal crop descriptor list was sweet potato in 1991. This was a crop that had been given a more central place in CGIAR research initiatives beginning in the mid 1980s, chiefly in order to address concerns that uh, this you know, kind of global governing institution for international development was not actually adequately prioritizing the needs of smallholder farmers and key subsistence crops. So moving to something like sweet potato um, was for many reasons um, a signal of um, um, shifting priorities uh, within the CGIAR. So in 1991, the maximal descriptor list, as I'll, I'll refer to it, was produced by the geneticist and new central sweet potato gene bank curator, Zosimo Kuaman, who, working alongside others, found that the existing list that he had, um, which had been created um, a decade earlier as part of the, the, the first wave of descriptor lists produced by IBPGR, he found that existing minimal list was inadequate to the diversity of global samples that had been assigned to his care. He found he needed more categories of crop descriptors and especially more options of descriptor states in order to faithfully identify and share his sweet potato accessions. Encompassing though his uh, list was, that list um, uh, which you see published here, was still insufficient in the eyes of social scientists who in the 1990s sought to integrate farmer knowledge more thoroughly into agricultural research. So Huaman's lists were really geared toward um, breeders and other professional scientists working with crops. Social scientists wanted at the time to do more to, to integrate local um, and uh, uh, other forms of knowledge uh, into their assessments uh, and more thoroughly into agricultural research uh, in general. So these scientists' uh, ambitions of making agricultural research more sensitive to the needs and experiences of farmers included, among other goals, collating farmer knowledge alongside professional breeder knowledges and incorporating this into gene bank databases. Doing this, as I'm sure you can imagine, required further innovations in the documentation model, that model of standardized descriptors compiled chiefly by agronomists and other scientists. In one of the most influential proposals made uh, for an alternative, the anthropologist Virginia Nazarea developed the protocols for what she called memory banking as a practice to accompany gene banking, including at some um, institutions, for example, like the, the International Potato Center. So Nazarea's model, which was developed or prototyped on a collection of 50 plus varieties of sweet potatoes grown in an area of the Philippines where she worked, included farmers and scientists characterizations of each variety, farmers and scientists drawings, farmers criteria for evaluating sweet potatoes, compilations of beliefs and practices linked to sweet potatoes, audio recordings and transcripts of farmers' life histories, and agricultural calendars as well. Uh, so you can get a sense of the, the comprehensiveness of this enterprise. Uh, and one of Nazarea's associates um, at the time characterized her memory bank work as, quote, the maximal approach to the documentation of indigenous knowledge. And surely it was uh, this uh, uh, indeed, in, even in comparison to the maximal sweet potato descriptor revision uh, that Huaman had undertaken at the International Potato Center a few years earlier. I offer you these very brief um, sort of snapshot examples of descriptor development in the 1980s and 90s in order to illustrate how scientists responding to the demands of an international agricultural research community that was increasingly sensitive to the critiques it had uh, experienced of narrowness and exclusivity really started to take pains to develop tools and approaches that would enable as wide a possible a range of participants and plants and knowledges to be incorporated into developing databases. Unfortunately, maximalism also ultimately produced its own kinds of exclusivities, uh, demanding financial resources and time that few researchers had. By the end of the 1990s, crop descriptor lists had once again reverted to minimalism, 
And memory banking uh, remained and remains today a little use corrective to traditional gene bank documentation procedures. For my purposes today, I think these examples highlight yet another facet of the embeddedness of political objectives in database development. So in this case, the embeddedness of the goals of making research more inclusive, both in terms of who it serves and whose knowledge it recognizes. Of course, in some ways it's extreme in this example, but I think um, uh, what seem like they might just be technical choices at multiple different scales are often also fraught with similar questions of priorities, of access, uh, and they of course determine the horizons of future possibility as well. And so these, uh, these um, uh, kind of significant examples or examples of significant movement should remind us of the, the smaller shifts and changes that, that sometimes operate in similar ways. So that concludes my reflections on selected moments in the history of database development in order to support genetic resources conservation. I'm really looking forward to reflections, thoughts, questions, uh, and to a dialogue uh, in the time that we have left. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that very interesting talk. So let's see if anyone has questions, remember to write them down in the in the Q and A um, box in Zoom. I really found very interesting this concept of the memory bank mm -hmm. and so associated with the with the gene data and so. Yes, I mean, I think there's um, uh, the the most prominent examples of follow ups on the memory bank con concept. Um, do take place within the um, the sort of outside um, the major international gene banking enterprises. And so um, smaller scale, especially in situ or community based uh, seed exchange networks have developed some of these ideas about uh, developing memory banks alongside um, uh, other kind of more formal descriptions of, of things that are kept within collections. Oh, there's a question. How do you see the seed banks developing in high throughput approaches for DNA barcoding? I mean, that's a great question. I'm going to preface it by saying that historians, uh, as a rule, have a hard time thinking into the future in in, in kind of specific <laughs> ways. Um, um, but, you know, I, I know that there's a lot of work going on right now, especially around some of the, the um, uh, major crop collections, right, in order to support um, uh, more efficient and more kind of targeted breeding program. So I know both the, the wheat and maize gene banks are, are doing um, uh, more sequencing activities specifically in, in support of breeding. Um, and what I think I'd be interested to know is to, is to think about the ways in which um, the technologies that are available now that weren't available in the period um, that I discussed here in the talk could be used to support a diverse array of agendas, um, could be um, um, thought of as resources for kind of potentially, you know, unlocking um, greater uses of or interest in um, crops that haven't seen as much research attention um, and so on. I think one of the, well, there's two, there's two issues that folks often ask about. Um, uh, one is about um, whether you know genomic information will ever replace seed seed bank collections. For example, I think that's very unlikely. I think we still don't know much about moving from from the DNA to the to the entity itself. But I'm sure folks in this in this space will already um, appreciate that. Um, uh, but the other thing is about who owns the data that's produced when um, that kind of work is done. And that's obviously something that's um, under intense debate and scrutiny right now because it seems to undo the International Seed Treaty. Um, and so folks have a lot of concern about doing too much sequencing within gene banks before we have um, better protections um, for, for um, ownership and use of the resulting data um, because we don't want to kind of re-inscribe exclusive practices or kind of create basically 
neo-colonial relationships um, because of who who has the greatest access to um, um, genomic tools, uh, basically. Um, anyway, so those are some thoughts on on the relationship of these to the future. I see there's a follow up here. Yes. Yes, we do this here at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, but as you say, it's based on our need and not everyone has the same resources and duplication can become an issue. We yes. totally agree on the point of new colonial <laughs> approaches. Yes, yes, yeah. So I think um I hadn't been thinking about it in the in the in in relationship to 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 food inspection. Um, but um uh, within within gene banks, I think this is definitely a kind of fraught and still developing area. I can see that when when you talk about the the gym banks, it seems very much like some crop related, you know, the sweet potato and the maize and uh, something. Are there initiatives that go more across or that try to put all those initiatives together? Or, you know, is there a place where you can find all the ones that exist? Across species. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of good examples. I mean, there's, you know, well, first, I should preface this by saying I'm obviously most familiar with the, the plant um, um, world. Um, but the, uh, you know, the Q Millennium Seed Bank is, of course, wild species. So it it, it encompasses a, a greater range. Many of the crop gene banks are crop specific in part because they or, you know, have a, a few that they specialize in. Mm. The, in the United States, the main central germplasm conservation, long-term germplasm conservation unit does bring together plant and animal germplasm into its spaces. Um, and there are some quote unquote frozen zoos like cryopreservation banks that again, kind of bridge species. Um, but I don't know of anywhere that is attempting to be the entire arc, uh, if you will. Um, but I would be glad to be corrected if someone there um, knows about this enterprise. There we go. Oh, yeah. World Gene Bank catalog, um, but I'm wondering about the actual materials themselves. I think those are um, are there are fewer examples of of centralization there, um, just because yeah. of the challenges of making. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's more complicated. Yes, yeah, so so we have another question. How about the idea of paying the local community for conserving the land races in situ to support the gene bank? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a, a wonderful observation and something that um, has been a focus of, so I mentioned in the talk, these controversies in the 1980s about conservation in centralized gene banks that happened to significantly be in control of institutions in the global north, even though some were, were situated elsewhere. Um, and uh, I, I, it's, since the 1990s, um, um, a kind of related set of concerns and critiques about or responses to critiques of gene banks has been the development of programs to foster in situ conservation, um, um, to have local farmers uh, um, continuing to cultivate material, to continue to be um, kind of mixing seeds and um, exposing them to changes in climate and environment and, and, and cultural shifts as well. Um, and some of those do involve uh, direct support of farmers um, in terms of, um, you know, kind of paying them to be guardians of seed that Others are more focused on creating kind of community level institutions and in exchange so that folks always have access to land races, for example, that might have been um, uh, dominant in their in their region or their their area. Um, I think it's safe to say that those activities. As much though, there has been great interest and great kind of progress and development in those there. Um, um haven't had the kind of resources and attention um i think that that the gene banking approach has had in part because gene banks also make resources directly available in easy ways for scientists and so um there's already a kind of powerful group of people who can lobby for those institutions to receive support and it's harder um in many cases to make the the case for supporting farmers although um it's one of the main arguments of my book is that that's absolutely what we be, need to, to be doing. Um, um, if, if the ultimate goal is sustaining diversity in a broad sense, um, that actually this is uh, um, 
you know, any system of seed banking needs to be complemented by very robust ideas about keeping things in cultivation um, and moving things in and out of gene banks rather than seeing them chiefly as kind of storage facilities. There's like a comment in relation to that. So it's like some organization do for ecological ecosystem service. Right. Yes. Right. Um, I mean, I think it's it's challenging in some ways because the best the best conservators of uh, crop germplasm in many ways are are farmers um, and uh, it is politically challenging in um, a neoliberal global context to keep farmers on their land because there are so many forces arrayed against their being able to keep and maintain land and community, uh, which are essential to maintaining crops. And so I think it is, I mean, obviously ecosystem conservation is 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 has its own <laughs> political politically fraught elements to it. Um, but I think of these, these, um, you know, powerful interests are arrayed kind of against being able to do this thing specifically within the agricultural space, which is why it's remained so challenging. Yeah, in fact, the last question that we have now is related to that. The problem I see there are political cons, right? The government has to be supportive. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, and so I think as with so many things, that is why you know, gene banks have so much appeal um, because they seem to sidestep these like really fraught political spaces. Um, but yeah, it wasn't the intention of this talk, but I think definitely <laughs> engaging uh, in those um, those debates is 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 perhaps where we need to have more energy, especially if if conservation is the priority. <laughs>